All right, uh, shifting focus now to the big voice uh, on the show. It is uh, Jose Manuel Barrasso joining me on the broadcast to talk more about, well, the global conflict that is taking place and the number of wars that are taking place. Uh, Mr. Barrasso, thank you so much uh, for uh, joining me on uh, the show. Uh, he is a former uh, president of the European Commission, former prime minister of uh, Portugal. In fact, sir, let me start by asking you about what is happening in the Middle East right now. How do you view this and how do you see these tensions impact in the world, particularly, in fact, uh, Europe as well. Yes, I believe the geopolitical situation is getting worse day by day. In fact, what we had in Europe was extremely serious. We have the first full-scale war after the Second World War, I mean, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And uh, that is, in fact, uh, linked with many other developments, Most, much uh, bigger competition between the United States and China. And this is, of course, getting the global geopolitical landscape much more risky, volatile, more fragmented. And now we have this issue here in the Middle East. I mean, it's not now. We had it for decades. But sometimes it goes up, as we are seeing now, with, the, in some cases, unprecedented escalation. So, yes, I'm concerned. I know that there are some efforts to try to contain these uh, developments. I hope it will happen, but frankly, I'm not optimistic. Uh, if I want to be sincere, I think the situation will probably get worse. That's a very, very serious uh, assessment that you are making, uh, Mr. Barrasso, of this situation. Uh, then let me ask you as far as something that uh, Mario Draghi said recently in a report. Uh, he's the former prime minister of Italy, and he said that, in fact, that uh, Europe faces an existential crisis right now and an existential threat from both China and Russia. How do you respond to those concerns? I very much agree. I mean, if you read the report, the report is a wake-up call to the European leaders and the European opinion about the need to invest more in our competitiveness. I mean, Europe is a great place to be. I mean, Europe is one of the most, uh, let's say, developed and prosperous regions in the world. But we have problems, namely demographic problem. We have problems also with some kind of competitiveness. Um, we have been losing some competitiveness to the United States and also to China in some ways. So that's why Mario Draghi is, by the way, the friend former also president of the European Central Bank, is telling we have to invest more in our own competitiveness. So while Europe remains a very, overall, a very prosperous uh, area, I mean, and where with very high levels of economic and social development, there are risks that uh, if we don't adapt our economy to a more challenging environment, we may fall behind. And that's basically what Mario Draghi says. And I believe that this wake-up call will be well heard, uh, loud and clear, in uh, the capitals of Europe, because uh, there is this sentiment that we need to promote some reforms to become more competitive. All right. Uh, then let me also ask you about uh, EU's first defense minister. Uh, is defense and ramping up of military spends really going to define Europe going forward? Because you now have a defense minister for the very first time. Yes, because there is a war in Europe. Uh, there is a war. I mean, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Ukraine is not a member of the European Union, nor NATO, but it's our, it's our neighbor, very close. And precisely to avoid that war to go to other parts of Europe, for instance, that would be much dramatic if uh, Russia invades a European Union or a NATO country, the Europeans are now getting prepared for that. So yes, there will be more investment in defense. No doubts about it. There is now the European Commission designated the Commissioner for Defence. It's more for defence industries because uh, defence remains a national competence. But we are trying to see in Europe what we can do to reinforce our defence, certainly. And by the way, it's not just Europe, it's all over the world. If you see the, uh, what's going on in the United States, China and other parts of the world, we see a rise in defence expenditure. You're speaking about the Russia-Ukraine conflict, then let me ask you what role uh, can mediation play and what role can India play in some of these mediation efforts? We have an ambitious... Look, uh, uh, all those who believe they can help, they should help, of course, and India is a very important member of the global community, so certainly uh, all uh, efforts are welcome. Having said that, and if once again we want to be sincere and honest, intellectually honest, 
I don't think there will be a sustainable solution in the short term. It's possible there will be um, kind of a ceasefire or some kind of armistice or some kind of, let's say, frozen conflict. Probably next year there will be stronger efforts of diplomacy. Now people are waiting for the United, Nation, United States elections. But I don't see, frankly, and I know very well Russia, I know Mr. Putin for many, I met him many times, I know Ukraine, and I don't see a true reconciliation possible. Even if we come to some kind of provisional diplomatic solution, unfortunately, I think the tension will remain. And that's why in European Union and also in NATO, people are prepared. Prepare for war to avoid war. <laughs> it's the old... Roman saying that if you want peace, you should be prepared for war. Not because we want war. Nobody in Europe wants war. But, of course, to avoid it, we have to be strong enough to show that there are no good ideas if people want to enlarge war. So, yes, a possible solution for a ceasefire may happen, but I don't see in the short-medium term a real reconciliation uh, between Russia and Ukraine. After the world war in Europe, the two world wars we have now, I mean, the European Union. I received the Nobel Peace Prize for the European Union in 2012 because we made it impossible, wars between the countries of the European Union, between France and Germany, and uh, at that time, the UK. Or, or the, the, it's, it's impossible to conceive wars between European Union countries. But unfortunately, in the wider Europe, uh, when you think about Russia, this is not the case. So that's why it's important to, if possible, make peace, but make a peace that has conditions to be respected and the agreements to be honored. If you say it's going to be frozen peace, then how do you see this conflict actually being resolved? I think there will be some diplomatic efforts to come to an agreement. Unfortunately, I don't see the willingness namely on Russia, to come to that agreement. Uh, there will be, if Russia leaves Ukraine, there will be peace. Uh, Russia today is occupying around 20% of the Ukraine territory. Russia is the biggest country in the planet, geographically speaking. And they are invading a member of the United Nations, a country to which they promised the respect of territorial integrity and national sovereignty. So, without Russia accepting that that country has the right to exist in its own borders, it's very difficult, even if there is some kind of ceasefire, to have a sustainable peace for the long term. Look, and there are problems that last for decades. If you think about Korea, between North Korea and South Korea, uh, there is no war now, but there is also no peace. There is a kind of a frozen conflict. They are the two armies in front of each other. So, and that's, I'm afraid, what can happen in Ukraine and Russia. If there is not a, if Russia does not leave Ukraine, uh, I'm afraid that even if there is some kind of truce, some kind of ceasefire, it will not be sustainable in terms of the global architecture. That explains why, for instance, Finland and Sweden joined NATO. Before the invasion of, of uh, Ukraine by Russia, it was unthinkable to have Finland and Sweden in, in NATO. But now they feel threatened. They are, Finland has a big border, it's the biggest border with Russia. That's why NATO now is being reinforced. So, and this is the reality. 